So each of these complex, multi-layered sources, each one of them, you can find different la layers, each one possesses its own uh, emphases, its own agenda, its own perspectives. Sometimes they complement one another, sometimes they challenge and contradict one another, but they are not best seen as linear, as telling a neat linear story about Israelite religion flowering and fading. Their diversity has not been flattened or homogenized by the final editor of the text. It's been preserved in a manner that stimulates reflection and debate. So with those concluding remarks, we're going to move on now to the second major section of the Bible. We've been discussing the Torah, or Pentateuch, and now we're moving on to the section of the Bible that's referred to as the Prophets. This section of the Bible is, re is divided into two parts. We refer to as the former prophets and then the latter prophets. The former prophets will concern us for the next few lectures. And the former prophets include the books of Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. They read as a historical narrative. This material is a theologically oriented account of Israel's history from the conquest of Canaan, or what's represented as the conquest of Canaan, to the destruction of the state by the Babylonians in 587-586 BCE. This material is therefore crucial background to reading the Latter Prophets. Now the Latter Prophets is a collection of books, each of which bears the name of the individual whose prophecies it, it purports to contain. These prophecies were, these prophets delivered their oracles at critical junctures in Israel's history, in the nation's history. So their words are only going to make sense to us if we first understand the particular historical crises that they are addressing. And that, the historical narrative that runs from Joshua through 2 Kings provides that information. It tells us of the critical junctures in the nation's history, and that will help us then slot the different prophets in. So the former prophets, or the historical books, like the books of the Bible that we've already studied, contain various older sources that have been put together by a later hand. You have an editor or a group of editors who reworked these older sources. They were oral traditions. Some of them were probably records from royal, royal archives and so on. And they wove them together into the form that we have now, and that's a process that's referred to as redaction or editing. The anonymous person or group or school that's responsible for the final composition, the final redaction of these books, inserted, would put the materials together by inserting verses and speeches that would frame the older sources and link them together, give them some sort of common uniting thread. The redactors linking and framing passages and their revisions of the older sources exhibit certain common features. They harp on the same themes over and over again. They use some of the same language over and over again. They, have, they share certain assumptions. And those features and assumptions have a lot in common with the book of Deuteronomy. A lot in common with the book of Deuteronomy. And that's what led the German scholar Martin Note to surmise that Deuteronomy and these historical books really form a unit. So that Deuteronomy not only looks back and finishes off the Pentateuchal narrative, it looks forward as the beginning of, of really the historical account that's to follow. J, E, and P really seem to come to an end here. There's some debate about this. But because the interpretive history that runs from Joshua to 2 Kings is based on ideals that are set out in the book of Deuteronomy, we refer to the person or the persons who redacted this whole unit as the Deuteronomistic historian or the Deuteronomistic school. The whole unit as a whole was redacted after 622, that's clear. It assumes and insists upon the centralization of the cult. The last dated event that's mentioned in 2 Kings is something that occurred in 562. That was when King Jehoiachin was released from prison in Babylon in 562. So the work was probably concluded shortly after that date. So in exile or towards the end of the exilic period. Martin Note assumed that there was one editor. Other scholars have assumed that there were two or even more successive editions of this history because there are multiple perspectives that seem to be represented, but the last seems to be an exilic perspective, the perspective of someone sitting in exile, and we'll be returning to that in a future lecture.